Well, ladies and gentlemen, top of the morning to you. There's a little bit of writing about me, and I, I hate talking about myself, so you can just have a quick look at that. And then we'll get on to the real business. I think I'll stand up for this. Where's my stick? Where's the edge? The, yeah. I'll go back a bit here. Okay. I think I might just as well stand down here. Then I won't fall off the edge. Well, it would sort of cut things short, wouldn't it? <laughs> down to your level now. Let me get out of the way here. All right, next slide, please. Now, that's when I was a younger man playing rugby, but it was also my first year of zero tillage in soybeans in the state of Goiás in Brazil. And please note the straight rows. That cost me a lot of trouble with my tractor driver. Normally, they go like that. And I was thinking of into row cultivating at those days. Uh, the next, that was with Gramoxone. The next year, I started with glyphosate, and it cost $18 a litre. And the first time I used it, I went there a day later, and I said to my manager, D -d -d disc it out, it's not working. I didn't know about glyphosate taking time to work. You see? And so this is indicative of the problems people have in adjusting to a new system. And this visually shows you what we're doing with our lay farming. And I'll go through all the interactions and effects of this on the system. Next, please. And here you see a nice a photograph from an Imbrapa de demonstration farm where you're looking over the soybeans, over an, a pasture, and, and, and the cattle. Next, please. Now, the origins of lay farming are very, very old. They started off in Peru before Christ, uh, actually rotating uh, fallow grazing with uh, crops. The Romans also did it and enriched fallows. Jethro Tull started uh, integrating crops and livestock uh, with grazing turnips. And during the Second World War, George Stapleton uh, led the move to plow up old uh, uh, um, unproductive pastures to produce food for the war, war effort. Now, it seems to me that lay farming has gone a bit out of, out of um, use lately in UK. But it, it would seem to me that zero tillage might give it a new li lease of life. Next, please. Now, <coughs> this is what happens when you adopt zero tillage. Uh, you think about soil compaction. But usually in the, t in the move to a new system, the compaction is mental. Next, please. Next, please. Please, please put, all, all, there's a, put them all up. Put them all up. There you go. Lovely. So these are what we, what a very advanced farmer in Brazil, Aki van der Ven, a hot Dutch descent chap, he, he noted these benefits of the cattle and the lays for the crops. Nutrient recycling, soil restructuring, higher soil organic matter, and this increases our cation exchange capacity, which is very low on our uh, savanna soils. Um, it gives us less leaching of nutrients. We get a higher water holding capacity. 
more diversity in the, in the rotations, which breaks up pest and disease cycles. And we get control of crop weeds in the lay. Next, please. All of them. Oh, greater financial liquidity. Because you've got cattle, you get into trouble, you can sell them. If you've got a wheat crop in the, in, in, in the, in the so soil or soy boy in the crop, you've got to wait till harvest and your bank could foreclose on you. Benefits of the cropping for the cattle. Residual nutrients, especially phosphate, for pasture. This is totally different from the concept of lays in Europe. Lays in Europe are seen as a fertility restoring phase for the system. I would contest that a little bit. I think a lot of it is restoring soil, soil um, structure, which affects fertility. Anyway, um, we use the lays for dry season fodder, especially under sowing maize with, um, with grasses, principally brachiaria. The, the, the revisionists have now called it Eurocloa, but brachiaria is a much larger name. Um, and we get low-cost pasture renovation. It facilitates a change in the pasture species. We get a quicker return on investment. And again, we're breaking parasite cycles for the, for the, for the animals. Next, please. Now, don't be um, deluded by the left-hand scale because it starts at 3,000, not at zero. Because this shows you what happens when you either go to a crop after a pasture or you go to a pasture after a crop. On our soils, which are lacking in fertility in general, um, there is a drop-off in productivity for the first, for three years. And you see it's quite, quite uh, uh, high, 375 kilos of beef a hectare in the first year, and down to 135 kilos of beef a hectare in the, in the third year. And the same with soybeans, 3,500 kilos in the first year, you're down to 3,100 3, uh, in the third year. So three years is about the right length of lay and length of cropping phase for our situation. Next, please. This shows you what our alternatives are to produce winter pasture. First of all, as I said before, we can undersow the maize with pastures, usually Brachiaria species. And this gives you off-season beef production when the beef prices are high. And then you go back, you desiccate it again and go back into crops. Uh, you can come in after, after soybeans. And early soybeans allows you a second maize crop and you undersow that maize crop, and you get some more off-season off beef pro production, but for, for fewer months. Uh, you can go from soybeans straight to zero tillage planting of perennial and annual forages, and that also will give you off-season beef production. And thirdly, we can put in direct drilled forages after the soybean harvest. Next, please. So we have a lot of alternatives. Now this shows you what the evolution of the systems in northern Mato Grosso, which is symbolic of the whole Cerrado region. And years ago, let's say in, in 1990 around there, we, we were producing top yields of, of soybeans would be 3,800 kilos a hectare, but normally it would be around 3,000. And we'd only have soybeans, then we'd have fallow. And that led the weeds in. Then we got some shorter season so soybeans, and then we could have a second crop of maize. Uh, and after that, we've got the various systems where we're under sowing that maize, because uh, after the maize, you get another shorter fallow. Um, we have got very much locked into this soybean maize succession. And it's not a true uh, diverse rotation, a plural, uh, plural, pluriannual rotation. 
Unfortunately, we're stuck in this. I see your English farmers here. Um, you're a lot better on crop diversity than we are. A lot better. The, the last one is a very good farmer. And you see what he, the, the games he's played with his rotation. He's got a reasonable rotation there. The others were, uh, are mostly reflecting what the mainstream are doing. Next, please. Ah, if you have a look at this and go back one, please. Now you can see, get a better picture of, of what it's all about. Okay, thanks. Now this is another farmer, a very good farmer. Knew his father. Um, now he, he rotates the crops around his farm, but he only has 25% in maize. The rest is soybeans. And uh, this is quite typical of our, of our uh, situation in Brazil. Maybe some of them will get up to half of it in maize, but then you run out of rain for the maize, so you have to go through to things like sorghum and then millet and other uh, cover crops. Next, please. This is, shows you what he does in his second crop season. He's got the 140-day maize from before. He can plant so sorghum. He can plant millet. He can plant beans or so sunflower uh, in the early part of the second crop, or he can plant pasture. The crops rotate around the farm, so he's getting a little bit of a rotation uh, in, 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 in the farm. But it's mainly main crop soybeans followed by maize. Next, please. And this is planting brachiaria seed the little white boxes, uh, after soybean harvest. That's a 21-row planter, West Bahia. It's, they're very infertile soils, but we put everything into the soils, everything. And so from an infertile soil, you get to a soil that can produce up to four tons of soybeans a hectare and up to eight tons of maize. Next, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I misled you. That was planting millet and not planting brachiaria, but the same system is used. Now, this farmer, Aki van der Vinnie, the, the, the first one I spoke about with the, with the advantages, he prefers to plant his... This is a, a, a panicum. And he prefers to plant it in the interior of the soybeans. And if necessary, he hits it with a subdose sub of, of glyphosate because they're R.I. Um, soybeans, to check it. Next, please. And just before the maize harvest, there you are. You've got your pasture already established. Next, please. And look at that. After you harvest, look at what you've got in terms of good fodder and maize stover. And the maize stover is very important to us in these low soil organic matter soils in order to create enough residue to replace the organic matter. Getting maize into the system, even though it's a second crop uh, succession, was the savior of our zero tillage. We wouldn't have been very sustainable if we didn't have that uh, input, heavy input of, of residue from the maize. Next, please. And can you bring it up, bring it down a bit? Can you? There you are. We'll leave it there. Leave it there. No, leave it where it was, <laughs> so we can read it. Oh dear, never mind. Well, it's just the look of pride and contentment on those guys' faces. They're, they've recently adopted this system and they're seeing how it works. And it's so nice to see a farmer with a smile on his face. Next, please. This is a system invented by Imbrapa for 
southern Mato Grosso, and it shows you how uh, they can, they're so advanced now, they can take a degraded pasture and produce a good soybean crop because they have to put everything into it. But everything, I mean, it's lime, it's gypsum, it's phosphate, it's NPK, it's micro, and if you put enough in, you can get a full soybean crop in the first year of a degraded pasture. And those degraded pastures are producing virtually nothing. Uh, they might be producing 10 kilos of beef a hectare a year. Oh, we, 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 on the thing, we saw 135. But that, that's a lot better than the deg degraded pastures here. So after that, the soybeans go into pasture again, and then it starts rotating. They have two years of pasture, one year of soybeans, two years of pasture, and soybeans again. Okay, next please. Now, this is a financial analysis of that kind of system. The traditional system on the left, the zillatory system on the right. And just look at the bottom line. That's all you have to do, look at the bottom line. Uh, the beef cattle produce very, very little profit in the traditional system. And in the zero tillage system, they're producing 50% 50, 50 more. No, 400% more, sorry. 50% more on the, on the crop return, on the maize. 25% extra return on the soybeans. So the rotation is bringing all that benefit. Next, please. This is, uh, indicates the productiv productivity of beef in various forms of renovation and the degraded pasture before. Degraded pasture before, 51 kilos of beef per hectare per year, and with a very good fertilizer lime micro thing, we bring it up to 334.5 kilograms of beef per hectare per year. So it's a tremendous difference, tremendous. Next, please. Now, this is some Australian work. It's not zero tillage, but it just shows what a lay does for soil restructuring. This measures the infiltration rate of the, of the soil during the pasture lay, it goes up and up and up. Going to pasture, cropping, it goes down. Pasture goes back up again. Crop goes down again, and the pasture brings it up again. So the idea that a, a, a pasture lay is only to bring back fertility, I think is, is a little bit uh, overstressed, because if you don't have the soil structure, your fertility won't work properly. So its soil structure is, is um, oh, no, I've got to use a Brazilian term now, viabilizing the, uh, the uh, whole system. Next, please. And this is literally hot off the press. Uh, I just got it two days ago. Um, very good piece of work by Embrapa. Uh, and they have shown that nitrogen is occluded into soil crumbs. So with no tillage that makes more crumbs, uh, you get an effect of reducing the emission of nitrous oxide. And apparently, uh, Rothamsted examined this a bit, and they said, well, they didn't have enough evidence to say which way it was. This is a very good piece of work. And it gives us a lot of bargaining position with the environmentalists. Next, please. This is another farm, another pioneer farmer. Uh, I knew his father-in-law, too. Um, and this shows you three systems he had. The first system is irrigated. You see the, the, um, the brown there is irrigated beans. Uh, the green is pasture, and the dark green is another type of pasture. 
and the the yellow is 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 maize, right? Now I'm going to show you a, a in the bottom is the original rotation that he had before he adopted integrated crop livestock systems, uh, lay farming. Next, please. Now this shows you a financial analysis of that. Uh, remember that the um, number one rotation is irrigated and number two and number three not. And just look at the internal rates of return. I like the internal rate of return because it incorporates some longer term things. This, these were 20 years projections. And I think with financial analysis these days, people just look at one bottom line. And we are not factoring in the I increased productivity we're getting from cover crops. And this should be put against their costs. But I think a lot of people look at the cover crop as just a co cost. And we must factor this, these long-term benefits of soil structure and um, uh, cover crops into our analysis. And if you do a 20-year farm analysis, you're automatically integrating these factors as long as you've measured them properly. <laughs> now, and this is at two levels of soybean price. And you see how uh, the farmers are, are very susceptible to price. If you look at the lower price at 21 reais a 60 kilo bag of soybeans, you see that the number three rotation is negative, and the original pasture, the, the separate pasture and crops, is so negative it didn't come out in the analysis. So you see also the um, undiscounted net benefit is what would would be for the farmer if he was using his own money. And that gives you, uh, as well as, um, uh, I keep breaking into Portuguese, uh, sometimes this gives you a much better picture of what the financial implications are. Next, please. Next, please. There we go. Don't they look nice? Don't try and walk in that field, they'll go for you. <laughs> Even if they haven't got any horns. Next, please. Now, this is a, a pioneer, another pioneer farmer, Ricardo de Castro, Castro Morales, Morales, and he was the first president of our uh, No Till Farmers Association from the Cerrado, the wet, dry, tropical region of Brazil. And uh, he was our first president in 1992 when we founded it. And he made this analysis. Just cock cattle, it gives him a 14% return on investment. Just crops gives him a 44%. If he puts the both together, it goes up to 46%. But if he adopts a different system where he undersows maize with, with uh, Brachiaria, and then takes it off the uh, center pivot and feeds it to cattle as a green feed, he raises return on capital to 50%. So I think this is a very, very good little graph to show you really the improvement you can get in integrating crops and, and livestock in a lay farming system. Next, please. This is a very nice diagram, but you, you're going to take a little bit of time to understand it. The dotted line is the, the biomass, the microbial biomass. The, the undotted line is the maize demand for nitrogen. Now, you see, when you first get into zero tillage, the microbes are going to attack the nitrogen fertilizer and the crop is going to lack it. If you look at the very early stages of maize, the microbes are at their maximum assimilation of, of, of nitrogen in the soil. So they will be competing for the crop in the early stages. So what we've discovered is the first two or three years, you have to put more nitrogen into the system 
But then after that, the night microbes are cycling it round, and you don't need it anymore. Next, please. Now then, yes, this is bovine heaven. Um, I haven't got it up here, but there's some studies in the States that show that cows suffering stress, heat stress, they produce up to a thousand kilos of meat less, uh, milk less a year from heat stress. So this is why I call this bovine heaven. It's an agri, uh, uh, an integrated crop livestock system using crops for the first three or four years. And then you establish, as the shading gets too much or the, or the competition from the tree get, get too much, then you undersow it with brachiaria. And then you've got uh, a nice pasture and happy cattle. Next, please. And this is an um, indication of the carbon sequestration in this eucalyptus plantation. And you see it goes up to nearly seven tons of carbon a hectare a year. And this is why the Brazilian government has their low carbon uh, um, agriculture project, because they, they, they need to meet their Paris uh, targets. And so they're, they're pushing this uh, agroforestry. And uh, it's, I think it's, these figures are very, very impressive. Next, please. That's on Cerrado soils, yes. Um, these are some r results from such a system. Um, this particular system had um, 1,667 eucalypts per, per hectare in four rows, 22 meters apart. And the seven-year average raw term yield, timber yield, 40 meters, cu cubic meters a hectare a year. Annual crops a year three, pasture thereafter. And comparing the system production of, of kilos of beef per hectare to the prior farm average, you've got, well, well it's two and a half times. So that just shows you the value of, of these integrated systems. And also, you bring the slaughter age down to two and two and a half years against the three to four years uh, uh, of uh, 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 unimproved pasture, where well, we call it the sanf sanfona effect. What's that called? The, the musical instrument. Accordion. The accordion effect. Because the cattle get fat in the rains, and then they get thin in, in, in the dry. And then they get fat in the rains, they get thin in the dry. It takes them three years to get to slaughter age. Next, please. And this can also be done with teak. And teak is a very fast growing, very good hardwood. And the interesting thing about it is the white, uh, the sapwood, is just as hard as the hardwood. And you make lovely furniture from it. Next, please. And with slaughter age, we can produce 33% less methane per kilo of meat produced. Now that's a way to sell things to environmentalists. I've got a list of that and I forgot this one. Next please. Weed suppression. That's another function of the lay. And if you see here, the crops are wheat, rye, rye sunflower, Oh, 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 oh she little yellow, little yellow flowered um, legume, uh, trefoil. There you go, and the last one is fallow. So you see, the fallow is far worse than anything else, and some your wheat and your your rye are very, very good at suppressing uh, suppressing weeds. So the choice of a cover crop is very important and it, it will also depend on the weeds you've got. But this shows you the potential you've got to deal with weeds via a cover crop. Next please. Now this shows you again in a, 
lucerne pasture in australia how much it reduced the wild oat population continuous wheat 11600 plants per hectare after uh, a lucerne lay the first crop only 85 and even with the fourth crop you've got a quarter of the number of wild oat plants that you had with the, with, with, with the continuous wheat. So continuous anything is going to give you problems, both with weeds and pests and diseases. Next, please. I think I'm going to sit down. You can put me a chair here. Now then, earthworms and dung beetles. André Voisin, the famous chap with the rotating pastures, um, he measured 57 tons of earthworm casts a year on a productive pasture. Now, isn't that something? Now, there are about 50 species of dung beetles in UK, but they're declining because of vermicides uh, active in the dung, and also cattle are taking off the, taken off the pastures in, during winter and, and put on uh, 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 in, in a barn. In North Carolina, dung beetle ha have been shown to recycle dung nutrients in pastures, mainly phosphorus and potassium, but also calcium, magnesium, and, and microelements. In Australia New Zealand, they imported dung beetles because they didn't have any. And they imported, I think, about 50, over, over 100 species. They imported to New Zealand and, and Australia, mainly to control fly larvae. But uh, the dung beetles do a lovely job of incorporating that into the soil. Sorry about my limitations. No, I've got to turn around here. Next, please. Uh, this is some English data. Uh, Dr. John Holland, he wrote a very, very good paper on conservation agriculture about 15 years ago. And it was, it's a, a very good paper. I, I would recommend everyone to read that. But he has shown that if you're spring plowing, you're doing away with a lot of beetle larvae because you're breaking them up with the plow. And so your system helps to determine the predators that you've got in your soil. And if you're turning them over with, with the plow, you're going to lose them, or part of them anyway. And uh, I would reckon there's a beetle bank subsidy isn't there. Uh, why can't we declare the whole of a, a no-till farm to be a beetle bank? Wouldn't that give you a nice return? Yeah? But w w we've got to work on the politicians on that one. That will scare them, but it might bring them down to earth. Next, please. Uh, this shows you it's not very f well focused. But on the left is a, a route going down through a beetle burrow. These are, these are scarab beetles, and they, they make vertical burrows in, U, in, in, in Brazil. I counted 25 per meter squared after about three years of zero tillage. And so that helps you to control erosion, because with that kind of infiltration, you won't get much erosion. Next, please. Um, this is a, a new science, nitrogen transfer from legumes to grasses. 30 years ago, I had the uh, Australian uh, number one in, in forage legumes, and he swore to me that there was no transfer. But apparently now that they're, they're being to, able to show it, and white clover is apparently a lot better as a companion crop than lucerne. Uh, I don't think you've had much space for tree legumes here, but this leucina in 
tropical areas, it can fix over 500 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. That is really something. In Sri Lanka, uh, there's an area on the coast, 1,500 millimeters of rain. 27% uh, of the nitrogen in grass was transferred from Lucina. But to maximize below ground nitrogen transfers, we need species compatibility. So I said, this is a new science. But we need this information because you have to choose the right companion crop for a legume or vice versa. Next, please. Root exudates. Now, this is something we don't see, but they are so important to soil life. And I just listed a number of the uh, f functions that they have. In general, the root ex exudates regulate the rhizosphere. And in the rhizosphere, there's a lot going on. Uh, they, your root exudates can be used to, for food, for soil microbes. Can be used for glue to form soil aggregates. Can be, they can solubilize nutrients, especially phosphorus. Our, our soils in Brazil fix a lot of phosphorus. And uh, that's a new area too. We ha we're using ground mica schist as a rock meal. And there are farmers who've been doing that for five years and they haven't used any more chemical fertilizer and they're getting the same yields. And the scientists are contesting it. What do you do? Next, ah, attraction of rhizobium and mycorrhiza. Very important too. Allelopathy. Some roots can ex exude herbicides and help to control species which might con c compete with them. Uh, this is quite complex. Uh, control of soil-borne diseases and also pest repellents. So we, we have to start thinking like a root to manage no-till. You must think like a root. Next, please. Here's a companion crop of, of uh, sun hemp in sunflower, and that will be uh, killed off with a herbicide a little later and f furnish more nitrogen to the sunflower. There's a very interesting system developed in the Philippines where they plant uh, sesbania, I think, in between the rice, and they kill it off at about 40 days with 2,4-D. And then it covers the soil, but it also releases nitrogen slowly in homeopathic doses, which don't exceed the root absorption capacity. When we put nitrogen on a planting, how much do you think the, the little plant can absorb of that? So that nitrogen, is, is susceptible to leaching for a long time before the plant's capacity to absorb a whole of, a, a, a lot of it. Next, please. Uh, cover crops. I am totally against calling them green manure crops. This is a wrong concept because it, it brings into people's mind plowing it down. So I, I really insist on cover, pro cover crops. But you see what can happen to maize yields after different cover crops uh, and at different nitrogen doses, both in zero tillage, which is plantio diretto, and conventional tillage on the right. So you see it's all in, in kilos per hectare. And uh, y there are really some very interesting results there. You, you, you compare the lowest yield with the highest yield. And why, why do you think the black oats, that's Avea Preta there, why do you think the black oats, uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the fallow has such a low yield? You see, uh, no nitrogen put in, etc., etc. So 
we, we can play the tunes on the cover crops according to what main crop we want to influence. Next, please. This is a field of white oats, direct drilled in Paraná State in Brazil. Uh, we, can gr we grow quite a lot of black oats there, and I believe people are using black oats here, here a bit as well, are you? Put your hand up who's using black oats. Anyone? Oh, good, good. It's a, it's a very hardy plant. And if you roll it at the milk stage, you will kill it all. So that's another way of getting rid of glyphosate. Next, please. And clear water. This is a, a, a stream after 80 millimeters of rain. Under conventional tillage, that would be all brown. It so happens that 90% of that municipality is under zero tillage, and that's the reason. That's the reason for the clean water. So we can sell clean water to the environmentalists too. Next, please. And how do we convince environmentalists to support no-till? They're all hep about the ills of glyphosate. They're incapable of doing a trade-off balance. And so we've got to find other, other ways of convincing them. Now, no-till farmers are constantly reducing their glyphosate and other chemicals. We've heard that from several farmers today. No-till increases soil organic matter and sequesters lots of carbon. That's sexy for the politicians. High biological activity degrades agrochemicals faster. I've got, I've got a slide on that, but I didn't, wasn't able to include it. You've got wildlife overwintering, over and this is fostering. Uh, 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 it is fostered by weed seeds and uh, spillover grain, and that helps the uh, wildlife to overwinter. And also, skylarks, skylarks are especially endangered, and they are helped by not plowing the soil and doing away with their nesting sites. Uh, nitrogen oxide emissions are lower in no-till and in well-drained soils. We have, there's, a recent, uh, there's a recent Brazilian paper on that. Uh, soil fauna are ex enhanced, that is, includes beetles and earthworms and a lot of other ones. Aquifer recharge, that's in interesting for the Thames Valley Water Authority. And water quality are improved by no-till. And you're also reducing flood risk. So these are arguments that we need to use to sell the, the image of the zero-tillage farmer, the no-till farmer, to the environmentalists, because we're getting a lot of flack and we don't deserve it. So let's work up the arguments to counter what a lot of people are saying, especially in the press. Next, please. So this is a provocation. Why is lay farming and also ran these days in UK? In Brazil, I've shown you the calculations on the financial returns. So, are farmers being deluded by immediate cash crop returns? Or have the long-term benefits of a lay not been monetarized? Farmers say greater than 25 years after a permanent pasture has been plowed that they can see the results. Uh, it's similar with cover crops because many of their benefits are not immediate. In the UK environment, are the long-term soil health benefits sufficient to justify the sacrifice of an arable crop to include a lay? So that's my provocation, but I'm open for any questions and assassination if necessary. <laughs>